Well, good morning. Um, I, my name is Stephen Nichols. I'm excited to be with you. I work as the youth director here, and we're in the middle of a series uh, called There's More to Following Jesus Than Just Liking Jesus. Um, so I'm excited to be here, and I, I want to um, open up with a question that's kind of a rhetorical question, but have you ever had uh, something in your life that you loved so much or valued so much that you would literally do anything and everything to uh, accommodate that in your life? It didn't matter what it was, you would alter any part of your life to accommodate whatever that that was. Just raise a hand if, if you've ever felt that way before. Uh, so my wife, Mariah, and I, um, as many of you know, some of you don't, we just had something that was very similar to that in our life that changed our life very, very drastically. And last De or this December, we had our first baby, and his name is Gabriel Jude. You can throw a picture of us up on there. That's us up there. And it's been, it's been an absolutely wild thing. I'm not a baby person by any means, but you can throw the next one up. Look at this face here. It's the cutest little guy of all time. And I'm not a baby person. I'm not a little kid person at all. In fact, most of the time, I think they kind of stink and they smell and they're kind of annoying sometimes. So usually I'm like, okay, you can, you can keep your baby. I don't want to hold your baby or anything. But if you're a parent in the room, you, you get this idea. And if you're not yet, this is kind of what it feels like. There's this moment when this baby comes out and this baby's born, even if you're not a baby person. And in that moment, you're like, I will do anything and everything for this baby, right? Parents, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm not a baby person at all, but I know that this kid, I would change anything in my life. And in fact, our whole lives have been shipped or, or flipped upside down and shipped all back and forth uh, all over the place because this baby has now entered into our lives and changed everything about us. Our whole value system. He loves sleeping with his hands up by his face. He's a big fan of that. He's doing this thing now when every time I walk into the room, he'll smile at me. And then yesterday we were doing this thing where I turn around and then come back and he'd smile again. And I turn around and come back and he'd smile again. So it's been an absolute joy. I would never do that with any other human being on the planet, but yet I do it with this little tiny thing that can't even talk back to me. Uh, so it has been an absolutely uh, just disorienting thing of how our lives have been flipped upside down. And many of us have had things like that, whether it's a kid, a school, a job, relationship, where we have something that flips our entire life upside down uh, because I believe that the thing that we value, the things that we love the most often determine how we live our lives. The things that we love the most, the things that we put at the highest value system of our life, they will often determine the things that we do, the things that we think, the things that we believe because we love and we value these things so much. And Jesus actually has a lot to say about the things that we value in our life, the things that we put as the most important things in our life, the things that we love the absolute most. He has a lot to say about the things that we value most. And some of these things are actually pretty difficult to hear. In fact, what we find is that Jesus asks us to complete an exclusive love and loyalty to him. And that's difficult. Because remember, if we love something, if our value is in something, then it changes who we are. And if Jesus asks us to complete love and loyalty to him, sometimes that means that we will have to change something about ourselves that is uncomfortable or change something in our life that is uncomfortable because what we value will change our decisions and our actions. And Jesus will sometimes ask us to these things. And the question that has to be asked when we, when we hear these things is, is it worth it? Is Jesus worth that? Is he worth our ultimate love and value? And I want to read a passage. This is found in Matthew chapter 6. And I want to explain to you what's going to happen here. So I want to read this passage. And this is Jesus talking about our value systems here. And, and I want to read this passage first. And then afterwards, we're going to go back and we're going to kind of uh, start going over some of the context of what's happening in this passage. Does that make sense? You guys all with me here? Just nod up and down if you're with me. Okay, cool. So this is found in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Jesus says this. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Get this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If then the light is in you, it's darkness. How great is the darkness? And then this is the kicker. He says, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. So this passage that Jesus talking of, is speaking on, it's a small section of one of Jesus's most famous sermons of all time. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you have heard it before. If you haven't, it's called the Sermon on the Mount and is one of the, the biggest messages that Jesus has ever given because it encompasses everything about who Jesus is. It's, it's something that's countercultural to the people he's talking to. And it's the description of everything that Jesus has come to do on the earth and what he has called us to be. And it's almost this introduction manual of what it looks like for you and I to live in the kingdom of heaven and what it looks like when God brings the kingdom of heaven here down on earth. So this is a small section of this. And this sermon takes place from Matthew chapter five all the way through Matthew chapter seven. And I wanna look at the beginning of this sermon because this gives us an incredibly deep insight as to how we're supposed to see and view this, this sermon in, in Matthew chapter six and what it can mean for for us. Uh, so I want to look back at Matthew chapter one. This is him beginning this message in verse one. Jesus, it says this, seeing the crowds, he went up onto the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them. Okay. This might not sound revolutionary or very important off this, but I think this is telling us two really important things that I think we have to understand. Number one is this, Jesus is talking to you. In this message, in the sermon, Jesus is talking to you. Verse one tells us that he gathered together and all of these crowds came together. He says he pulled his disciples, the people who were following him and who were devoted to him. And he said he pulled the crowds together as well and he began to speak and teach them. So here's what this means. Whether you have been following Jesus for 15 years, 20 years, 50 years, a one year, whatever it is, he's speaking to you as a disciple and follower of Jesus. He is speaking to you. He's also speaking to the crowds. Oftentimes in the New Testament, the crowds were depicted as people who were kind of on the fence. They wanted to know who Jesus was. He said some pretty crazy things. He was doing some pretty crazy things. Uh, so they wanted to hear more, but they weren't really sure about Jesus yet. So I want you to know, if you are here in this room and you're, and you're saying, I'm not really sure about Jesus yet. I don't really know if he's worth following. I don't really know if he's worth giving my life to. I want you to know Jesus is talking to you. He's talking to you. The second thing it says this, verse two says this. He, um, and the second point I want to make is that Jesus's words are to be taken very seriously. To be, to be taken very seriously. Verse two says this. It says, and he opened his mouth and taught them. He opened his mouth and taught them. Do you notice anything odd about that? Matthew strangely tells us that Jesus opened his mouth in order to speak. And that's kind of redundant, right? Like, of course, if you're going to say something to somebody, if you're going to speak, that's really redundant. You don't have to communicate that you're going to open your mouth. And here's what's true. The biblical authors were very, very intentional about the words that they used. They did not waste words. They were attempting to communicate something. So here's what I think is happening here. I think that this word, this mouth word, is attempting to connect us to something else, to something, another verse, another story. And in fact, just a few verses before this in Matthew 4, Jesus is being tempted in the desert by Satan. And he says this to the devil. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's that word mouth again. And to be fair, in, the, in most English translations, uh, mouth sometimes is or is not used, but in the Greek, this is the same exact word. This word mouth is being used. Here's what I think this is communicating. Jesus is assuming the position and the authority of God in this moment. 
He's saying that this, the level and the weight of God's commands that come out of the mouth of God hold the same level and weight that come out of the mouth of Jesus. And just like when Moses went up to this mountain to bring the law down to the people of Israel, Jesus is coming and he's on this mountain and he's bringing a new law, a new kingdom, a new promise, a new covenant to his people. And he's saying, I am the kingly authority of this new kingdom. He's equating himself with God here. That's a big deal. So Jesus's words are to be taken very seriously and not just seriously. We're supposed to see the words that Jesus is speaking as this new kingdom that is coming. And Jesus is claiming, I am the king of this new kingdom. The mouth of God and the mouth of Jesus are to be taken as the same thing. So we have to understand this as we read chapter six. So Jesus continues in chapter six of what we just read. And he says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So here's what he's saying. He, he's taking two different kingdoms and he's putting them up, up against each other. He says, there's the kingdom of earth and then there's the kingdom of heaven. And we can store up treasures here on earth. We can store up things here on earth or we can build up treasures on heaven. And he's putting these two things against each other. And what often happens is, is we often are people who will take, 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 and take, and we will build things up for our own gain, for our own benefit, for our own profit, without ever releasing back out to build up the kingdom of God, to build treasures in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is putting these two things up against each other. And he says, don't build up treasures here on earth. Why? Because they cannot hold you. They will not last. They will rust. They will be destroyed. They can be stolen. They can break. Whatever it is, they will not be able to hold you. The things that we can build up here on this earth with the treasures of earth, they will not ultimately save us. They cannot bring us ultimate joy or purpose or hope or peace or forgiveness of sins. They cannot save you. So Jesus says, build up treasures in heaven. And here's... here's Here's the problem is that oftentimes you, you may be aware of this. This is true for me a lot of times too, is that there's this thing about human beings where we will do this thing where we will just take and take and take and build up and build up and build up and get everything that we need to because we don't want to miss an opportunity. We don't want to be left out. We don't want to be left feeling like we didn't get something that we should have gotten. So we will take and we will hold on to the things that we have with a clenched fist without ever truly giving and releasing out to build up the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So why do we do that if we know that it's not going to bring us ultimate salvation? And here's what I think is true. I think oftentimes we'll build up treasures here on earth instead of building into the kingdom of God is because we have an incorrect view of God. If we have a view of God as being a scarcity God, a God who cannot provide for us, a God who does not give out generously or who will not provide the things that we want or the things that we need to, to continue moving. If we, if we believe in a God who will selfishly hold on to things and only give out things to people who deserve it most or who love him most, then we ourselves will hold on to the things we have. We will never let go of the things that we have because we are not confident that God will be able to provide for us. We do not believe that Jesus can give us the things that we need. So we will hold on to what we have. Do we have a view of God that gives generously? Or do we have a view of God that is a scarcity God who will not provide the things that we need in order to keep moving? And here's why this is important. If we have the view of God where we will, we, we, he will not give us the things that we need and we view him as someone who's not generous, we will live that way and it will ultimately turn us to serve something else. Remember, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The things that you value, that's where your heart's gonna be. 
And ultimately what's happening is that our view and our worship of God will shift to something else and we will serve something else. And Jesus comes out and he's straight up, he says it in verse 24, he says, you cannot serve two masters for you either hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus is saying in the kingdom of heaven, he's not looking to share loyalty with people. He's not looking to share loyalty with anything else. He says, you cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve your children in money. You cannot serve your politics in money. You cannot serve your own comfort in God. I apologize. You cannot serve your own comfort in God. You can't serve money in God. All of these things come up in contrast. And in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is looking for exclusive loyalty to himself. And here... Here's what's true. Jesus is not saying these things because he's insecure and he's gonna feel bad about himself if we don't give him the love that he feels like he needs. He's not gonna sit in a corner and cry and feel uh, you know, like he's not worth anything if we do not give him the love that he needs. Jesus is telling us these things. He's saying that you cannot serve both of these things at the same time. It's because he knows that the things that we build up here, uh, the treasures of earth, these things will not hold us. And if we ever try to put the expectation or the burden of God on someone or something else, they will not be able to hold us. You cannot put the expectation and the burden of God on anything else. It will crumble and it will fail. It will rust. It will destroy. It can be stolen. It can be taken away. It cannot hold us. It cannot save us. It cannot bring us hope. It cannot bring us full redemption. So Jesus says, you cannot serve God in money. And in this passage, he's, of course, talking about money and treasures and, and things like that. But you, you put that name in whatever else that looks like for you. Maybe that is your own family. Maybe that is your politics. Maybe that is your own uh, 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 comfort or the, the desire to want to feel approved by other people. You cannot serve both those things because it will crush you. And it cannot hold you. So Jesus says you cannot serve both of those things. When we view God as a scarcity God, it will, it will lead us to look to other things instead. Only when we can see Jesus for who he really is, can we say that he is enough for me. That he is sufficient for me. That my trust is in him and him alone because I believe that he will provide the things that I need in my heart and in my life. So how would we know, how would we know if that were us, right? How would we know if that were something that inside of my own heart, that there were other things, other idols, if you will, that were coming up uh, to the surface that I was giving my ultimate love and devotion to outside of Jesus. And the good news is this passage goes on and it shows us what happens when we have a scarcity view of God. And, and chapter six continues in verse 25. Jesus says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in his, all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that, is God, if that is how God's clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow's thrown to the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly fathers knows that you need them. And finally, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you. So how does this connect? What's the significance of this? And if you, if you have something to write down, if you want to take a mental note of this, this is what I want you to get. Oftentimes, oftentimes our deepest fears and anxieties will expose our hidden idols. Often our deepest fears and anxieties, the things that we fear the most, will expose our hidden idols. 
And here's what I'm, I'm not saying, and I want to be clear on this. I, this is not a conversation about clinical anxiety. Uh, this is not a conversation about mental health or anything of those lines. I am not telling you that if you just love Jesus enough, if you're just good enough at following Jesus, that you wouldn't have to deal with mental health. That is, that's not what I'm trying to communicate here. But what I am saying is oftentimes the things that we worry about, the things that we fear, will often expose something in our hearts, something that we are trusting more than God. And in this story, what it's saying is if we're fearing that God will not provide for us, we fear that God will not be able to give us the things that we need. We will ultimately turn to other things and we will fear and we will worry. And God says, why do you fear? Why do you worry? Don't you know that the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, they have what they need. They have everything that they need to continue. Are you not much more valuable than they? It says you do not need to fear. You do not need to worry. You do not need to turn to other things. You don't have to put your treasure into other things. You can trust that Jesus is faithful and he will provide. And when we have these moments, when we're fearing, when we're full of worry and anxiety, we should pay attention to those thoughts. We should pay attention to what's triggering those emotions inside of us because it can start to point to what things are being attacked or what things are starting to crumble that we're not comfortable with. So Jesus says, you don't need to fear. You do not need to worry because he's not a God of scarcity. He is a generous God who will provide the things that you need in order to keep moving. And this does not mean, this does not mean that we will be rich. It doesn't mean that we'll always have a comfortable life. It doesn't mean that we'll get everything that we want, but it means that Jesus, we can be confident that Jesus will provide the things that we need to keep moving. Does that make sense? He is faithful. He is faithful. So what are the fears inside of us that motivate our decisions? Because ultimately, those things will allow us to turn to something other than God. So what's our solution here? Jesus says at the very end of this, in verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Put Jesus back at ultimate love, ultimate authority, ultimate value in your life. Allow him and his kingdom and his ways to be the ultimate driver of your life. And then it says this, and then all of these things will be added to you. All of these things will be added to you. Again, this is not a promise of wealth. This is not a promise of a, a, an easy or comfortable life, but this is a promise that Jesus will remain faithful. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do not attempt to share loyalty with Jesus because it will only hurt you. Seek first the kingdom of God. So what could that look like? for you and for me, if we decided that we were going to seek first the kingdom of God, how might our lives change? What would look different about ourselves? How would, how would we operate or believe or think differently if we truly were seeking first the kingdom of God? And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, maybe it might look like we don't try to go out for jobs or, or, or for schools, not because we want to do them, but because we know that it's going to give us some type of status and we'll do that just so people think highly of us. Or maybe when our kids are misbehaving or they're, they're not given the opportunities as some other kid at school or something like that, we will not be overcome with worry or fear about me being a bad parent or them not being ahead in life because we are confident in knowing that Jesus will provide the things that we need. Maybe it looks like when somebody else wins a political election or somebody says something against our own ideologies that we don't have to respond in anger. We don't have to respond in fear because we know that Jesus is faithful. We do not believe in a God of scarcity. We believe in a generous God, a God that allows us to live our lives generously, building up the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So what would it look like for you and for me to seek first the kingdom of God? Seek first the kingdom of God because I believe that he is enough. I believe he's enough. 
I believe he brings forgiveness. I believe he brings hope. You don't have to look to other things or other people to remove that shame in your life. You don't have to try to uh, work harder or be a better follower of Jesus in order to counteract the sin and the guilt in your own heart. Jesus is enough. Will you seek first the kingdom of God? So I'm going to invite the worship team back on the stage and we're going to do something here. And this might be a little bit different, but I think this could be incredibly helpful. So as the worship team comes back up, um, I I want you guys to start to sit and reflect because I don't want you to just know something different now. I want you guys to be able to live something differently now and to believe something different. So here's what I'm going to do. Remember, often our deepest fears will expose the hidden idols inside of our hearts. So here's what we're going to do. The band is going to play. And if you have a pen or a notebook or a phone, whatever it is, I want you to pull that out right now. And I want you guys to take, we're going to probably 60 seconds or so for you to reflect what things in your life bring you the most fear. What brings the most fear and anxiety in your heart? What are those things? And I want you to take those things and write them down. Name them. And start to, start to think about and reflect on what is triggering those fears. What idol could be being attacked inside of my heart that's making me worry, that's making me fearful. And I want you to write those things down and begin to reflect on those things so you can see these are the things that I'm trusting in. These are the things that I'm loving in most. So as the band begins to play for a few seconds here, I'm going to encourage you, take the time now, reflect, close your eyes, pray, write down the things, the fears that come up in your heart. Keep writing, keep writing down. Go to God, ask him to reveal the things that are hidden in your heart. Maybe for you, it's the the idea that you want to be loved so you will give your heart, you will give your life to any guy or to any girl that will come up because you just want that approval. Do you know that Jesus loves you enough? You don't need the approval from others. Maybe you're terrified that you cannot provide for your family anymore and that, and that you're not gonna be able to give your family things that you need. So you're tempted uh, to, to, to act out in a way that could not be healthy for you or for your family. Can I tell you that Jesus is faithful? Seek first his kingdom. Continue writing. So in a second here, we're going to sing this song. We're going to uh, go back to the song called Christ Be Magnified. And the bridge goes, I will not turn to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. So as we sing this song, as we, we go about and we say, Christ, you be magnified. I'm going to seek first your kingdom. I'm going to put you as ultimate love of my life. I'm going to seek first your kingdom above anything else. As we sing the song, I want you to declare that, saying that Jesus, I have trusted in other things. I have looked to other things, but I'm saying today that I follow you. I follow your kingdom. I follow your word. I follow after what you have to say. And I want you to take the things that you just wrote down on your, on your phone or on that paper. And I want you to lay those things down at the feet of Jesus. Say, I'm surrendering these things. I'm no longer trusting in these things anymore. I'm trusting in you again, Jesus, because he is faithful. He is a generous God. He provides forgiveness. He provides hope. He repeals and gets rid of shame and guilt. Nothing else, nothing else can hold us except for the name of Jesus. So will you stand on your feet today with us as we begin to cry out on the name of Jesus together.